Just a trigger warning, this episode includes discussions about loneliness, social isolation, and mental health challenges related to disability. This content may be sensitive to some listeners. If these topics are difficult for you, please feel free to skip this episode. Also, there will be a couple of podcast announcements for 2024 at the end of this episode as well. Right, let's get started. I hope you're all having a lovely start to the year. Thank you for all the kind responses on the previous solo episode. It was very fun to dress up to add to the fun shenanigans where I kind of info dumped about disability within musical theatre. I hope to expand on that topic further by integrating performers and creative crews behind disabled pieces into future episodes, so stay tuned for that. I thought that with the start of the year, people are often shifting jobs during this period, starting fresh within academic environments, moving to different places, or even countries, and trying to implement New Year's resolutions into their daily habits. It can be perceived as overwhelming, but also in an isolating time. Disability can add layers of complexity to social interactions and accessibility, making the feelings of isolation even more acute. New people, different schedules, different physical environments to navigate using mobility aids, and particularly for college students living alone for the first time. In discussions with my family, my New Year's resolution was to feel less lonely, which seems counterintuitive since I talk into a microphone to an audience and have a batch of communication. You'd think that with my passion for talking and doing theatre that I would be great at interacting in social environments. However, this is not the case. In terms of my home environment, I interact with my family members on a daily basis. A certain co-host meows at me multiple times every day asking for treats. Surely that must make me feel less lonely. But despite every stereotypical cure, aka attending social events, going on walks, going into the city, going shopping, etc., my contact with my friends beyond virtual messaging apps is limited. In fact, the holiday season was one of the only times I interacted with people beyond my immediate family members at all. And there was only one week of socialization since my studies finished in October. Now, my intention with this social life contextualization isn't to elicit pity, but rather to contextualize this discussion within a wider discourse of intersectionality. It's important to acknowledge from the outset that I am an able-bodied individual The impact of the physical environment on our capacity to engage in social and interpersonal interactions at events or within communal third spaces to interact within a marketplace of ideas is a significant aspect of this conversation. However, that might be a discussion for an entirely separate episode. The immobilization of disabled people due to architectural or environmental barriers is still a continuous battle between disabled peoples, central governments and across countries. Personally, I would rather invite the opportunity for multiple disabled people to discuss how physical environments can facilitate or constrain social interactions within public environments than risk speaking on a significant aspect that can contribute to an individual's loneliness, since I personally do not have the lived experience to comment on this. I would love for this episode to be a launching pad for wider discussion regarding the topic of disability and the silent isolation that can often manifest as a result. If you want to share your story and contribute to the ongoing discussion, Feel free to leave a comment, like, or write a Q&A response on whichever platform you're currently listening on. If you want to share your story and contribute to the ongoing discussion, feel free to leave a comment, like, or a Q&A response on whichever platform you're listening on. If you want to hear more discussions about media representations of female and gender diverse disability, click the bell notification or drop a like on YouTube because these platform algorithms are hungry for statistical sustenance. So in today's episode, we will delve into the nuanced relationship between disability and loneliness, synthesizing existing intersectional research and academic literature to frame the discussion. Please note that I am not a clinical psychologist. I am presenting the information as disseminated through my own lived experience of disability. So some important questions that I thought of answering would include, how does the social construction of disability through media products shape individual experiences of loneliness? And in what ways can altering these narratives about disability impact these experiences? What strategies can be employed to mitigate or manage loneliness in disabled individuals? So, first off, what is loneliness? According to the World Health Organization, loneliness is a growing global concern with profound effects on mental and physical health across all ages. It's reported that one in four older people experience social isolation, and up to 15% of adolescents feel lonely. The impact of loneliness on health and longevity is significant, equaling risks of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Recognizing this importance, the UN Decade of Health Aging is prioritizing social isolation and loneliness in its public health and policy agenda, addressing it across various demographic groups. But if this is such a global issue, according to the WHO, that has been arguably exacerbated by the pandemic, 
how does it affect disabled peoples in particular? So according to Loneliness New Zealand, it is extremely common for disabled people to become lonely. They describe the following behaviours that are indicative of loneliness that may commonly manifest within disabled peoples, which is including but not limited to needing high levels of attention, getting angry and frustrated, withdrawing from your family, becoming more socially isolated, increasing your visits to the doctor, and getting tearful all the time. The New Zealand General Social Survey of 2018 concluded that within the past four years of their study, 53% of disabled New Zealanders aged 15 and over reported feeling lonely at least some of the time, compared to 61.7% of non-disabled individuals who felt loneliness none of the time. Moreover, 16.5% of disabled respondents experienced loneliness most or all of the time, significantly higher than the 3.1% of their non-disabled counterparts. Keep in mind that this is a small subset of disabled peoples from a tiny Commonwealth country. However, this disparity in impact of loneliness compared to their non-disabled counterparts seems to be a common theme across the academic literature that I've noticed. So speaking of the academic literature itself, I thought I would highlight some of the most poignant research articles as case studies for how loneliness and disability can be intertwined. Please keep in mind that if you would like to do further reading of these academic articles, they will be linked in the works cited section in the description below. First, there's I Get By With A Little Help From My Friends, Adults With Intellectual Disability Discuss Loneliness from 2006. This article explores the experiences of loneliness among adults with intellectual disabilities and the effectiveness of support systems in promoting their quality of life. The study utilized a mixed methods approach combining a piloted loneliness scale with qualitative techniques to gain a comprehensive understanding of the participants' experiences of loneliness. So the study involved a per sample of 51 participants with intellectual disabilities with limited to intermittent support needs. The participants were aged 16 to 52 years and were verbal with no physical or sensory disabilities. The researchers piloted a loneliness scale and used qualitative semi-structured interview format techniques to identify factors influencing the participants' experiences of loneliness. One of the key elements that I thought was most notable was the integration of quotes from the participants as they described their own loneliness. So amongst the six most lonely participants, four spoke of having or having had significant relationships with other people with disabilities. There was a really good quote from one of the participants that said, quote, we both have a disability. We both know what it is like to have a disability. She finds it hard to get friends or, quote, he's just like me, has a disability, but different. I'm goofy and he's quiet. These individuals suggest that after leaving school, making friends is difficult, but easier when another person had a disability. So firstly, I do relate to this sentiment. As I have mentioned in earlier episodes, I'm convinced that there is some kind of equivalent of a neurodivergent gaydar. A lot of my friends that I had within school environments, including primary and intermediate, aka middle and high school for my American viewers, were at the periphery within the wider social environment of the student body. All we had was each other. In hindsight, it was like shoving a neon pink sign up around our friend group. We all shared and understood our own thought processes, but I don't mean it in a misogynistic r slash not like the girls where like, ooh, look at all these other girls gossiping for their own entertainment instead of reading Thundercats or Eragon or the Gone series kind of way. I mean that within the more brute environment of preaching and maturity that transitions into teenagehood, there was security in surrounding yourself with those who articulated similar thought mechanisms to you, even if you were never able to put your finger on why. I always had assumed it was because of some other external signifiers like being a gig being placed onto us or being known as the weirdos who shit and read their books in a circle in complete silence on the playground. But years later, I still often get messages from my friends asking about the diagnostic process after listening to the podcast or reading my poetry zines and recognizing themselves in them. Even during in-person conversations, if I bump into my friends on the train, more often times than not, they will tell me, oh, I got diagnosed. I think to myself, of course. However, I certainly wouldn't say that I'm any kind of authority on an individual's diagnosis. I am not a clinical psychologist, but I find it interesting that you'd think with such a technologically deterministic approach toward technology, making us more connected than ever would aid in keeping those ties of friendship of younger years together. But once you reach adult milestones, it makes it harder for those with disabilities to keep in contact with those who are also disabled to help them get through difficult times. So from the research, the key findings were the experience of loneliness. So the participants reported experiencing loneliness in ways comparable to the general population highlighted the universality of this emotional experience among individuals with intellectual disabilities. They highlighted the effectiveness of mixed methods approaches. So the study demonstrated the effectiveness of combining qualitative and quantitative techniques to enhance understanding of the participant's perspective. So the qualitative analysis added depth to quantitative findings, conveying distinct differences between the perspectives and experiences 
of participants classified as most lonely and least lonely. So they also provided recommendations for support. So they offered recommendations for families and professionals to, to consider when assisting individuals with intellectual disabilities in addressing loneliness. So practical experience in fostering connections, such as finding friends to contact, information, exchanging greetings, and facilitating social outings was highlighted as crucial for addressing loneliness amongst the disabled population. The study emphasized the importance of considering the qualitative experiences of individuals with intellectual disabilities when developing support strategies for loneliness. It also underscored the need for practical assistance and meaningful relationships to address loneliness effectively. Next is vulnerability to loneliness in people with intellectual disabilities, an explanatory model, which was published in 2014. So this article presents a theoretical model of vulnerability to loneliness in individuals with intellectual disabilities. So the authors review existing research on loneliness in children and adults with intellectual disabilities and propose a model that encompasses social attitudes and expectations, opportunities and experiences and skill deficits associated with intellectual disability. So for its methodology, the article utilized a review and synthesis of existing academic research on loneliness in individuals with intellectual disabilities. The methodology includes a comprehensive analysis of the available evidence to identify key factors contributing to loneliness in this particular subset of the population. So the key findings for this academic article indicated that individuals with intellectual disabilities are highly vulnerable to loneliness, with up to half of them estimated to be chronically lonely, compared to 15 to 30% of the general population. Children with intellectual disability may experience even higher rates of loneliness, with estimates of 60 to 65% experiencing difficulties with friendships and social isolation. Additionally, the study highlights that individuals with intellectual disability report higher levels of loneliness compared to their typically developing peers. Chronic loneliness can have significant aspects on the cognitive, physical, and mental health of individuals with intellectual disabilities. So I could suggest that the cognitive, physical, and mental health problems already associated with intellectual disability are likely to be compounded by experiences of chronic loneliness. Mental health disorders such as depression and anxiety may be triggered or worsened by loneliness, and physical health problems could be exacerbated. Also, lifestyle choices such as smoking, alcohol consumption, and reduced physical activity could potentially also compound these outcomes for the disabled population. The article emphasizes the need for interventions and support strategies to address the vulnerability to loneliness in people with intellectual disabilities. While specific interventions are not detailed in the article itself, which we'll get to a little bit further in the later articles, the theoretical model proposed by the authors provides a starting point for developing a more sophisticated understanding of the experiences of loneliness for individuals with intellectual disabilities. So next we have a social model of loneliness, the roles of disability, social resources and cognitive impairment, which was published in 2017. So this article explores the social model of loneliness in older adults, focusing on the impact of disability, social resources and cognitive impairment. The study utilizes a mediation model to examine the pathway between disability, social resources and loneliness, as well as a moderated mediation model to assess the moderating effect of cognitive impairment on this pathway. So the research draws on the CFAS Wales data set, a nationally representative study of community dwelling people aged 65 and older. So the study identified disability as a significant factor contributing to loneliness in older adults, with social resources mediating the relationship between disability and loneliness. Cognitive impairment also plays a role in influencing loneliness and it moderates the effect of social resources on loneliness. Cognitive impairment can also impact the pathway to loneliness for older people by impending social interactions with family and friends and interfering with judgments concerning satisfaction with relationships. The study highlighted the complex relationship between cognitive impairment and loneliness, emphasizing the need for interventions that consider the social environment and cognitive functioning of the individual with a disability. So the findings suggest that the interventions to decrease loneliness in older adults should consider the social environment that they're in, the internalization of negative images of cognitive impairment in the media, and any discrimination or ableism that could be factored in as well. So this really emphasizes the need for integrated research and interventions that address sociocultural, social, structural, and psychosocial factors associated with cognitive impairment and loneliness. So they recommended some more practical implications for people that can surround the disabled person, which includes healthcare professionals that are working with older adults. They should consider the social and cognitive factors influencing loneliness and tailor interventions to address these complex interactions. Caregivers who can benefit from understanding the impact of cognitive impairment on social interaction and loneliness, and they should be supported in providing targeted social support to older adults and policymakers, so they need to recognize that the multifaceted nature of loneliness in older adults 
and develop interventions that address the social, cognitive and structural barriers to social interaction and support for disabled peoples. So the study provided valuable insights into the social model of loneliness, highlighting the need for comprehensive interventions that consider the interplay of disability, social resources and cognitive impairment. And in my opinion, it makes sense for the state of loneliness to be higher in people that are older. Often disability can come with isolating factors in itself, whether that is being unable to have enriching conversations about your special interest with neurotypical people, or well, the transition that exists between losing partners, co-workers or friends as you inevitably grow older. Next, we have The Invisible Enemy, Disability, Loneliness and Isolation, which was published in 2018. So the article adopts a barrier-based approach to examine the correlation between disability and feelings of loneliness and isolation. So the study not only seeks to establish whether individuals with disabilities encounter higher levels of loneliness and isolation compared to those without disabilities, but it also aims to interpret these experiences from a structural standpoint. So the methodology for this article employs a mixed method approach, integrating quantitative data collection and qualitative interviews from disabled participants. The quantitative analysis using the statistical package for the social sciences, which is in brackets SPSS, and qualitative thematic analysis was conducted. The study identifies significant disabling barriers, including inaccessible community structures, inadequately resourced social care, and the psychosocial emotional impact of these challenges on disabled participants. And they also stated that individuals with learning impairments are particularly vulnerable to experiencing social isolation and emotional loneliness. So the authors propose addressing the difficulties of loneliness and isolation faced by individuals with disabilities through a barrier-based approach. Their approach involves recognizing and tackling the disabling barriers contributing to the overrepresentation of disabled individuals amongst those experiencing loneliness and isolation. By interpreting these experiences from a structural perspective, the study aims to uncover key risk factors and develop strategies to alleviate the impact of these barriers. So these findings hold implications for policy and practice in supporting individuals with disabilities, understanding the specific challenges encountered by disabled individuals in relation to loneliness and isolation can guide the development of targeted interventions and support services. By addressing these disabling barriers identified in the study, Policymakers and practitioners can strive to create more inclusive and supportive environments for individuals with disabilities. So I am a little bit more biased with this one because this is more of like in my media content analysis, the American analysis wheelhouse in terms of the kind of research that I like to do. So Loneliness and Life Stories by People with Disabilities was published in 2021, which delves into the experiences of loneliness among di- people with disabilities in Finland. So the research question of the study is centered on understanding how people with disabilities comprehend and narrate loneliness in their life stories. So the study analyzed life story data from the collection Life of Disabled Persons in Finland from 2013 to 2014, which was organized by archive materials and traditional and contemporary culture of the Finnish Literature Society and the Threshold Association, which is a disability organization in Finland. The collection consists of 1,797 pages by 37 separate writers, including narratives by parents of children with disabilities and self-narratives of people with disabilities. So the data set includes various text types, such as life stories from early childhood to the present, children narratives focusing on the present moment, and narratives in verse form, so poetry. The study focuses on self-narratives and, and employs a narrative life course approach to analyze the data. So the key findings of the study found that loneliness involves both unwanted emotions and social isolation, that loneliness in life stories by people with disabilities is narrated in relation to a sense of bodily difference and occurs as a disconnection from the socially standard life course. The typical writer in the study was a middle-aged woman with physical disabilities and the narrative's experiences of unbelonging in childhood, disjointed youth and disaffiliation to normative institutions and adulthood. The study highlights the negative attitudes toward disability that feed social interaction and emotional loneliness. So the study took a relational perspective emphasizing the importance of understanding loneliness within the context of disability and the life course. The study aimed to illustrate how loneliness and disability are intertwined in the life course, focusing on the conditions of inclusion, which refers to the conditions of living and telling their own experiences, and shedding light on the experiences of loneliness amongst people with disabilities, and considering the social, emotional, and body bodily dimensions of loneliness within the context of disability itself. So the three dominant themes of loneliness that was discovered from these disabled people's life stories were determined within the three life stages, which were unbelonging in youth, disjointed youth, and disaffiliation in adulthood. One of the really good quotes that the article brought up by Faye Bound Aberte argued that loneliness is, quote, an embodied lived experience and highlights the intersections between the material culture of the body, social configurations, and emotional responses. The social patterning of bodily practice within social relations 
was narrativized as otherness, emotional unrelatedness, social isolation, and loneliness, end quote. According to Burkett, emotions are, quote, created from within the pattern of relationships, end quote. And I found this narrative element of the disabled experience quite interesting because according to the DSM-5, which is the most current of the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Illnesses, which a clinical psychologist used to diagnose yours truly with ASD, difficulties with social interaction are supposedly hardwired into the diagnostic criteria, including three central facets which further complicates the relationship between loneliness and disability. Is it my brain or is it the environment I surround myself in? So persistent challenges in social communication and, and interaction in various contexts are characterized by difficulties in social emotional reciprocity, such as abnormal approaches to socializing, limited conversational exchanges, and a lack of shared interest and emotional expression. There are also challenges in nonverbal communication for people with ASD, including inconsistent verbal and nonverbal integration, irregularities in eye contact, body language and gesture use, and a lack of facial expressions. There are also inherent difficulties in forming, sustaining, and understanding relationships, which often manifest as struggles to adapt behavior in social settings, difficulties in engaging in shared imaginative activities or forming friendships, and a lack of interest in their peers. So why does this diagnostic criteria matter? With ASD, it brings up an interesting point of contention as to whether loneliness is an inherent aspect of the disabled experience or whether it is more a wider social issue beyond the supposed to, quote, moral failings, unquote, of disabled individuals to be social. And throughout my life, I've noticed that even, you know, during primary school, when I would struggle to talk to people if it wasn't about cats, and I'd only want to talk about cats, and people would be like, why is that girl talking about cats all the time? That was how I tried to communicate with others and having that sense of rejection was frustrating for me because all I wanted was you know some kind of kinship some kind of friendship and you really do cling on to those kinds of people that you know just give you the time of day that just do the bare minimum so when they pull the rug out from underneath you it's frustrating because then you have to restart that whole experience and having the situation where supposedly your quote-unquote brain rather than your environment will undercut you and will make you seek and get yourself all the time. How does that help when you're trying to establish relationships that you can constantly fall back on when your environment may not help? Like, for instance, if I were to info dump on someone about musicals, I have to make sure that they have a similar understanding to me so that way if I start flicking them, you know, nerdy Christmas Day content or um, stuff about in transit, you know, I have to make sure that those people understand those shows to understand the jokes I'm making to understand the references I'm doing. And I don't mean that in like an, oh, I'm so much more sophisticated. I understand all these cool musicals. Like, I don't mean it like that. I mean it as in me sending musical content to you as a way of going, hey, I like you. Here's some little content. It's the equivalent of like a bird flying away from its little friend and going and picking up a worm and then bringing the worm back, dropping the worm at the bird's feet and being like, I brought you something that shows that I care. And then the bird picks it up and eats it. And they go, yes, that is good. Instead of being like, this is a worm? Why'd you get me a worm? I didn't ask for a worm. I asked for a leaf. Anyway, that's a kind of a weird metaphor, but you know what I mean? You really are desperate for some kind of reciprocal interaction. And you would do anything for that interaction. Because that's what the world tells you to do. It tells you to be social, to make friends. But if you don't have the same interests, or if you get so hyper-focused on a little hyper-focused tunnel and all you can think about is this specific show, then what does that mean? because you can't talk about it with anyone. But is it your brain, or is it the environment, or is it the socio-economical conditions that you were brought up in? So, who knows? Wild. In terms of more recent literature, there's health and well-being outcomes associated with loneliness for people with disability, a scoping review, which is published in November 2023. So, the article aims to explore the existing evidence regarding the health and well-being outcomes associated with loneliness for individuals with disabilities, the study follows a scoping review methodology and is guided by a priori protocol, ensuring transparency and reproducibility. The research questions focus on identifying the health and well-being outcomes associated with loneliness for working age adults with disabilities, the conceptual frameworks and measures used in this area, and the strengths, limitations and gaps in the published literature. So the scoping review was conducted by searching several databases for peer-reviewed English language articles published between the 1st of January 2000 and February the 8th, 2023. The search strategy was developed in consultation with an academic librarian and the senior author with content expertise in the field of disability and loneliness. Two independent reviewers completed screening, full text review, and data extraction with the consensus sought at each stage. Data was analyzed using content analysis and presented both numerically and narratively. 
in terms of quantitative and qualitative analysis. The scoping review identified a limited number of studies, so only nine, that examined the association between loneliness and health and well-being outcomes for people with disabilities. Most of the studies were quantitative and conducted in high-income countries. The findings suggest that relatively few studies have explored the association between loneliness and health and well-being outcomes for people with disabilities. However, most of the studies identified associations between loneliness and various health and well-being outcomes, including mental health outcomes, so for example, anxiety, depression, life satisfaction, or physical health outcomes, so self-reported poor health, chronic disease rates, and overall well-being. By recognizing the specific challenges faced by individuals with disabilities in relation to loneliness and its impact on health and well-being, policymakers and public health professionals can develop strategies to mitigate loneliness and improve overall health outcomes. So finally, we have the most recent article, which is Loneliness and Disability, a Systematic Review of Loneliness Conceptualization and Intervention Strategies, which is published in 2023. So the article aims to establish the relationship between loneliness and disability to explore the intervention strategies developed to counter loneliness amongst disabled individuals. The authors followed the preferred reporting items of systematic reviews and meta-analysis, so acronym is PRISMA, guidelines, and conducted a comprehensive literature search in electronic databases, including PsychInfo, PubMed, Scopus, and Web of Science. They identified in total 281 papers of which 75 reports were assessed for eligibility. The authors found that people with disabilities experienced loneliness to a greater extent than people without disabilities. However, they noticed a lack of consensus on whether loneliness in people with disability is a single construct or a collection of various subtypes. Additionally, the review did not find data on whether more disability leads to more perceived loneliness. Protective factors against loneliness in disabled people were identified, such as having a job or living in an environment without physical barriers that can inhibit social contact. So the authors define loneliness as a subjective feeling of social isolation. They highlight the need to consider the multidimensionality of interventions and loneliness for people with disabilities. They also emphasize the importance of understanding the relationship between the degree of disability and the perception of loneliness as well as the psychological process that modulate the experiences of loneliness, such as self-efficacy, competence, self-concept, and self-esteem. The review highlights the importance of considering the multidimensionality of interventions and loneliness for people with disabilities. So some of the key intervention strategies identified in the article include income support to improve opportunities for social participation and enhance the quality of life for individuals with disabilities. Financial support can play a crucial role in addressing loneliness by providing individuals with the means to engage in social activities and access various resources such as bus passes, public transport, being able to afford classes, that kind of social interaction. So implementing social programs and policies was another element that was aimed at adapting both the physical and social environment for disabled people. So this includes improving access to public services such as transportation, banking and recreational centres and social roles which includes employment or voluntary work. By creating an inclusive and accessible environment Individuals with disabilities can have increased opportunities for social interaction and community engagement as a result of these social programs and policies. So they also suggested social skills training as an intervention strategy. So this approach focuses on equipping individuals with disabilities with the necessary social skills to initiate and maintain social interactions. By enhancing social competence and communication skills, individuals may experience improved social connections and reduce feelings of loneliness. So they also mentioned the provision of enhanced social support is identified as a valuable intervention strategy. So this may involve the development of support networks, peer mentoring programs, and community-based initiative to provide individuals with disabilities with meaningful social connections and emotional support beyond their existing familial structure. So their family, their like caseworker, for instance, basically expanding their social environment with external people that come in to help to make sure that they're doing okay. And then finally, they mentioned cognitive training as a potential intervention strategy as well. This approach may involve cognitive behavioral interventions aimed at addressing negative thought patterns and cognitive distortions related to loneliness. By targeting cognitive processes, individuals with disabilities may develop more adaptive coping strategies and a more positive perception of social interactions as well as themselves to make sure that they are communicating. So it's important to know that while these intervention strategies are recommended and may seem superficially able to fix everything, the review also highlighted the limited availability of RCT-type experimental control studies focusing on loneliness and disability. So in other words, what they're saying is that they focus on the wide-ranging 
aspects of the relationship between disability and loneliness, but they were really criticizing the lack of actual attempted initiatives and experimentation to try and see what works best for the disabled peoples to be able to get them to engage with wider communities. So based on the synthesis of all of these significant academic articles that we've discussed, what conclusions can we draw about the strategies of managing loneliness as a disabled person? So I think firstly, cultivating strong social connections provides emotional support and a sense of belonging to a disabled person. So this could be through joining disability-focused groups, online communities or local clubs where shared experiences foster new and deeper connections with others if you have the capacity to. I think that accessible social environments are also crucial. So creating spaces where everyone can participate without barriers is vital. Accessibility in physical and digital realms ensures inclusivity, allowing disabled people to engage in social activities more easily and confidently. Enhancing communication skills aids in building and maintaining relationships. Programs focusing on social skills training can help disabled individuals navigate social situations more effectively. Support groups specifically tailored for disabled individuals can provide coping mechanisms for loneliness and improve a person's overall mental health well-being. Involvement in advocacy and community programs can also lead to policy changes for disabled people that make environments more inclusive. Often with disabled people, it is our very active resistance that empowers us to fight against ableism. Are there any community groups you could contribute to providing lived experience to advocate for others who may be more apprehensive to speak out? You can create further opportunities for social interaction with issues that you are passionate about. In all honesty, the whole reason why I began this podcast in the first place was because I cared about media representation of disabilities and how it can be improved. And since coming back to New Zealand and graduating, I have nobody in my immediate social circle to talk about it with. I created the podcast to provide an opportunity to speak with others about issues that continue to affect disabled peoples every day. I don't mean it in an evangelizing way or in a way to construct some kind of parasocial relationship like, oh, look at the disabled person being lonely, uwu. But the podcast has really helped me continue to talk to others about what I am passionate about and not isolate myself as much as I would typically do. So is there some kind of topic that makes you feel exhilarated to discuss? Pokemon, North mythology, comprehensive one night ultimate world strategies. Let me know in the comments below something that helps with your loneliness, any kind of fun topics you love to talk about that make your eyes light up. If you are feeling lonely, please remember that you're not alone, as cliche as it sounds. Your life is valuable. If you are in New Zealand, you can always use 1737. It is a free service for New Zealanders feeling down or anxious. You can call or text them for free 24 7. This episode is not sponsored by them or anything, but I thought I would mention it just in case it's needed. I will also link other mental health resources in the description as well as the academic articles I mentioned in today's episode. So, the strategies we've discussed today enhancing social networks, creating accessible environments, developing communication skills, seeking mental health support, and advocating for inclusive policies are pathways to a more connected life. Each step, no matter how small, is a move towards a community where everyone is included and valued. So reach out, engage, and remember your experiences and lived voice is important. So with that, thank you so much for listening to this episode of Seeing Me on the Screen. If you enjoyed this episode, please like, share, and subscribe to our Spotify and YouTube channels because the algorithm monsters need to be fed. So some other announcements about the podcast. For this year, I will be implementing a new monthly schedule on my Instagram which if you aren't following, what are you doing? Which will outline new episode publication dates to keep consistent. Also, in terms of real life stuff, I have accepted a two-year full-time graduate internship position, but I'm determined to balance the work slash podcast balance, which is why there will be a monthly, not fortnightly schedule to make sure you get longer, better quality episodes more consistently. I am also planning to post behind the scenes content on the Instagram too. All of the podcast episodes have been finally uploaded onto YouTube on seeing me on the screen podcast channel so people who do not have spotify will be able to be caught up on all the most recent and upcoming episodes i'm so excited for another year of podcast shenanigans and thank you so much for joining me see you next time that's my water don't know that that's disgusting princess that's my water don't drink that oh my goodness is this asmr is this is this all the podcast is going to be is just Post ASMR new YouTube channel idea. Okay, enough now, that's disgusting. Yucky, yucky.